So welcome to the first panel discussion of the food service hygiene dialogues. And this is an interesting one. Um, all of them are, but this is especially interesting because it relates to the current COVID-19 pandemic that we're all facing across the globe. In fact, this pandemic has been responsible for a lot of things. And one of those is the increased focus on hygiene. The hospitality industry has been struck hard. And if anything, the need to focus on hygiene has become even more important for this industry to thrive. Today, our panel of experts will discuss the important changes that the industry has seen as a result of the pandemic. And here are our pa panelists. Uh, Mr. Alan Zering, the Managing Director at Intertech Crystal Middle East and Africa. Mr. Bobby Krishna, Senior Food Safety Specialist, Food Safety Department, Dubai Municipality. Mr. Arwa, Mr. Arma Muhammad, Head of Food Control Section Acting, Ras Al Khaimah Municipality. Dr. Martin Easter, Chief Scientific Officer and General Manager, Hygiene International. Rasina Abdullah, Food Safety Manager, Abella and Company. Sudarshan Sataya, Senior Manager, HSE and Risk, Global Village. We also have Mr. Andrew Turner, Institutional Division Manager and of Reza Hygiene, as well as Mr. Nikki Ramchandani, founder of Zen Group of Restaurants, joining us shortly. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for being part of our event and of the panel discussion today. Uh, I'm just going to start with the first question in terms of, uh, you know, how, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the food service industry in the past year? How has cleaning and hygiene changed as a result? Um, I'm throwing the question open to any of the panelists who would like to answer first. Please go ahead. Well, would you like to just start? Sorry, this is Alan Ziering um, from Intertech Crystal has been introduced. I just want to uh, obviously thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, I would like Ashley to um, give a brief on what has happened really in the past 18 months in terms of responding to the pandemic and also another stage of it was recovering. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to exert its toll on the global economy, obviously there is an urgent demand emerging for all of us, uh, namely the expertise to actually give the support in order to respond to the crisis. This has been a continuous process and there's been uh, with us and other industries I actually work mainly for the hospitality industry, a critical window of opportunity to provide the industry specific, and not only guidelines, but also um, the um, support in terms of consultancy and actually to respond dynamically uh, to the um, crisis. Uh, in the hospitality sector, our actually, or the hotels industry continue to accommodate guests or quarantine, await repatriation, work in essential services in order to safeguard the guests and also the actually sort of staff. Um, and uh, what we did in the Intertech uh, Crystal organization, we developed a program, um, we called it POSI. I'm sure everybody um, knows about HACCP, it's a food safety management system. It's probably started 30, 40 years ago in the food industry. Now there is a new thing that we call POSI. POSI is the prevention of spread of infection. It's a, a, a comprehensive risk management system that deals with all the protocols uh, that could actually sort of prevent the spread of all viruses, uh, including obviously COVID-19 with all its mutations and um, evolving uh, sort of process. Um, and that it has been actually in place since last year. There's too many ashes of organizations been involved to develop and innovate um, in order to actually sort of put the right protocols, not only, as I said, to provide the guidelines and the um, advice, but to carry out a complete and comprehensive risk assessment and um, obviously um, cover all areas of operations in the industry. In the hospitality industry, it has been very um, uh, unique industry because it's probably, 
and you know probably all of you, the travel and hospitality industry is the most affected industry by the COVID-19. It has actually caused a loss of obviously recess in their, in their business. So the, the, the recovery has started. When the pandemic is still running its course, the revitalization of many of the world's key industries will be dependent on the ability not only to respond, but to recover from the uh, impact of it. And Intertech has the opportunity to serve the, uh, its clients, especially in the hotel industry, to respond rapidly to the reopening of their hotels uh, or markets. Uh, and also, uh, under very strained sort of supply chains restrictions, uh, with the consumer demands, the consumers and the traveling guests are demanding travel, but there are still travel restrictions. But there are new protocols that allow tour operators and allow hotels to open and operate within the safe environment and the minimum level of actually sort of prevention measures in order to prevent the spread of infection. It's been a struggle. It's been a journey. And I personally, which I come from a food industry, but I have been involved in um, many of the actually sort of catering and hotel industries and even restaurant industry when we adapted to new protocols, we developed new audit checklists, new risk assessment procedures for every facility customized to them. Uh, and many businesses are reactively not only responding, as I said, it's not about just responding to guidelines and following it or, and mitigating the impact. Uh, uh, it's relying on proactive measures to control or develop new protocols and once the pandemic is over, and probably never be over, we don't know, products and services aimed at proactively managing risks will be uh, in high demand to ensure that critical gaps in their business continuity and pandemic management planning are addressed. So, uh, and we are well positioned to respond and recover to the impending um, uh, uh, market demand uh, for this. Uh, there are lots of actually data, there's lots of guidelines what we can provide is, um, a, as I said, a risk management system. It's a system, it's not just protocols, it's not just guidelines, it's not just an audit, it's not just a training. That ensures that the a safe environment um, of, of the businesses uh, and the, the, the POSI check program that has been developed by us is not only specific to hospitality, it actually includes uh, many, um, um, sectors of the industry, whether office facilities, restaurants, warehouses, uh, factories, and others, uh, by simply implementing uh, this particular risk management system, um, uh, the industry will be able, as I said, um, to um, not only respond, but recover and ensure the safety of their consumers and the staffs alike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, Dr. Martin, would you like to add uh, to that from your perspective? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, Alan raises some very important points. Uh, and lastly, he mentioned that reassurance to um, the business, but also the consumer and the general public. And uh, one of the systems that I know Alan's companies use is, is uh, it's a rapid detection technology that, that our company provides. Uh, and that gives a, a numerical um, demonstration that the cleaning has not only been conducted, but been conducted well. And that gives a metric to be able to demonstrate, yes, these processes are in place and they are delivering a high standard of, of cleanliness. Um, we've seen a, a large uptake of the technology across the world um, uh, because of the, of the pandemic, because everybody wants to be seen to be doing the right thing and to prove that their interventions uh, do mitigate the risk. Uh, and that gives confidence not only to ongoing cleanliness within a facility, but also for a recovery program as well. Um, probably one of the biggest examples we've seen is, uh, is a nation approach, albeit a small landmass in, in Singapore. Uh, Singapore has a program called Singapore Clean, 
which its its mission is to provide that reassurance across many sectors, from hotels uh, through to uh, food service outlets and uh, public places, including transport, mass transport in particular. Um, and we've also seen a lot of airlines um, uh, picking up the technology uh, for uh, mass transport, not only within the aircraft, but in the food courts, the luggage trolleys, uh, and some of them have actually uh, presented um, their data on uh, mobile screen, so it's visible to the public. Uh, just like we have scores on the doors in restaurants, uh, the, those types of, uh, of facilities as well. So yes, it's uh, being able to demonstrate that something, some activity has taken place, uh, that gives confidence and reassurance, not only to the person providing the service, um, because we all know that um, if we wipe over a surface quickly, um, then that's only part of a solution and uh, it needs to be, any cleaning procedure needs to be delivered thoroughly uh, to ensure that the cleaning is actually effective. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, Mr. Bobby and Mr. Erva, both of you, uh, you know, being from municipalities, uh, have literally been on ground zero uh, when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic and food service establishments. Could you all highlight uh, how it has been, how it, how things have changed since the last year? Um, maybe, Mr. Erva, we can start with you. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be part of this uh, dialogue. Um, Yes, in, in terms of uh, regulatory authority and, and challenges that uh, uh, related to cleaning and disinfection, it really appears from the beginning when, when um, uh, COVID, uh, we realize that it's a virus and it has to be tackled by a specific uh, method and, 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 and way to, to, to rid of it. So the challenge was how we can, first of all, we need to, uh, as a regulator, sorry, to make sure that whatever cleaning uh, and, and sanitization uh, and disinfect, disinfectant uh, material, it is uh, from approved source and it is an effective enough to deal with this virus, which was a challenge. And uh, Professor Bobby, he knows that uh, only, only in Dubai or in Abu Dhabi, uh, there, is, there is this, uh, 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 this is standard of approving chemicals. So we, we were uh, lucky to have uh, Dubai system, to have Abu Dhabi system, to have maybe charge a system of approving this cleaning and disinfection and, and, and disinfectant. Uh, so to make sure that those premises, they are going to use an approved uh, material that will be uh, sufficient enough to deal with uh, viruses or with uh, Corona specifically. Uh, so we start from that. Uh, later on, we start getting uh, best practice, how we need to uh, have a protocol to, to deal with uh, positive cases, to deal with uh, suspected cases in, 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 some, in some time of this uh, pandemic. Uh, we, until now, I can say that now we are like in mature stage where we can, where we have our, our internal uh, procedure, where we will have now some international uh, best practices, which is, uh, which is uh, success to deal with, with Corona in, in terms of, of cleaning and disinfections. The, the, the challenge actually, uh, Mr. Allen, he, he referred to a risk assessment system. When we talk about hospitality and five-star, four-star hotel, yes, it is applicable. But when it comes to small and, and, and medium-sized premises, it's really a challenge to have a such system of risk assessment uh, where there is sometimes no, uh, no, no, no person in charge or no food safety in charge capable enough to deal with such uh, system. So by our resources, which is, and Mr. Bobby, he knows, always we, will, we have that lack of manpower sometimes, lack of resources as a regulatory authority because the number of and when Bobby, he will speak of sometime uh, of thousands of premises. And uh, when I go back to see my, my, my data, 
most of the cases, most of the repeated cases, it is coming from this type of premises, small and medium-sized premises, where there is no uh, proper uh, procedure for doing cleaning and disinfection, where there is no trained staff to use even this uh, uh, chemicals and, and, and detergent. And, and sometimes where there is no uh, proper follow-up maybe from regulatory authority on, on, each, on each case, uh, how they do sanitization, are they uh, closed premises, are they targeted to where those uh, positive cases where there was, there was uh, available or was uh, detected, are those uh, positive cases uh, properly isolated in a different room, in a different uh, accommodation with facility? So yes, uh, there, is, there is a challenge, but at, at overall, I can say now we are, we are in that stage where we can say, where we can um, confidentially, uh, where we can um, uh, like sure say that there is a system in place, yes. There is a challenges, yes. And such dialogue, we need to highlight those challenges and we need to try to uh, make uh, uh, whatever customized uh, system to them. If uh, Mr. Allen, he can customize this risk system uh, system to be applied for bakery, uh, for a tenor bakery, for sometimes a small shop that have one or two guys working uh, working working inside. This this type of dialogue we should come up with such solution. This is my perspective on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Adwa. Very very insightful. Um, Mr. Bobby, would you like to add to this and of course your experience as well? Thank you, Shanti. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk uh, in this panel. I think it's, it's, it's really timely and useful. The, the aspect that I would like to highlight from our, our experience in Dubai is that industry has been remarkably uh, you know, uh, cooperative in uh, food industry really worked with us uh, in this pandemic situation, despite having a lot of challenges with business uh, in you know, like the, uh, the financial crisis that, uh, that kind of got uh, triggered by the, the, uh, the lack of customers. Despite all these challenges, business did really well, and most businesses did really well. But then when we deal with something like novel coronavirus, we are looking at not just the dimension of business and the operators of business. We are also looking at the third dimension called consumers who behave very, very differently. And across the globe, we have seen that irrespective of where they're going, whether it's a five-star hotel or the small business, people behaved pretty much the same way. There were overcrowding issues, you know, like lack of cooperation and, you know, uh, challenges with, uh, one set would say that we want to behave in a certain way, the other set would say, oh, we, we are worried about something. And this was the conflict that we were trying to resolve throughout the pandemic. And businesses cannot do much because you, you don't have control on, on what people are doing. And I think that's that's the least addressed uh, of issues. Also, in, uh, we have to think about how we will move forward. Uh, even now, that continues to be a challenge. Um, and, and, and another aspect that I want to highlight is is that uh, we we know that cleaning of contact surfaces has been highlighted. Every business does this, but the frequency depends on several factors and where you know consumers have. Of, of, of rapid movement, you know, like coming in and out. We are not just looking at food contact surfaces. We are also looking at the the environment, the the interaction of the consumer with the environment. And we need to look at specific behavior patterns that 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 are specific to businesses. How you behave in a sushi bar is different from how you behave in a in a shisha place is different from how you behave in a pub. And and, and those elements, uh, as Alan was rightly pointing out, has to be customized based on a risk assessment plan. Uh, that 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 kind of delivers a desirable outcome. So it's very important to keep the business educated. It just not spraying the chemicals once in a day or cleaning once in a day that's going to save you. It's it's a constant watch and constant vigil around what's going on and 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 appropriately choosing your your disinfection and cleaning mechanisms. Over to you, Shant. Very very well said, uh, Bobby. Very very pertinent. Um, I think Andrew here as well. Welcome, Andrew. So glad to see you here. Can't hear you yet. You're on mute. Apologies, team. Uh, my IT department decided to upgrade our security system because of Aramco uh, yesterday, actually, and didn't tell me. 
So it's completely thrown all our settings. It's uh, disastrous, absolutely disastrous. And I found out as I was trying to enter in and figure out, trying to figure out why I couldn't get in. So anyway, here I am. No problem. We are so glad to have you here. We're, we're talking about uh, how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted uh, the food and food service industry. Um, I'm going to be continuing with the uh, topic at hand right now, and I will come to you very sure. soon. Yeah, thank you. After what uh, Bobby said, um, what comes to mind is uh, the, the place that Mr. Sudarshan works at, uh, Global Village. You guys literally opened um, your 25th season, if I'm not mistaken, in the midst of a pandemic. Yes. Tell us a little about that. How did it affect uh, you guys in the, in the first place? And how did you all manage to get past it? With, especially with the number of F&B operators that you have. Yeah. Um, thank you, Shanti. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Clean Middle East and uh, all the uh, speakers here they have um, uh, they have touched many points uh, basically uh, yeah when it comes to global village uh, you know it's it's a massive uh, event winter event a lot of people are expected to come and usually if you know um, the trend is we close the season and then we immediately prepare for the next uh, upcoming season because we have only six to seven months left unfortunately uh, the pandemic uh, uh, hit us somewhere in February, March, and then we went into lockdown mode. We couldn't complete season 24 even completely. Um, so we had to close uh, uh, earlier. And then a lockdown started, two, three months of darkness. Uh, uh, even uh, we were waiting for uh, further updates from the authorities. But we didn't stop there. We, uh, we were hopeful. Uh, we know at some point of time, uh, we will have to uh, resume everything. So we started the planning. Uh, for season 25 opening we had very grand plans for uh, season 25 which is our silver jubilee opening so we had the dates finalized we started the planning as uh, uh, everyone almost pointed out uh, risk mitigation uh, identifying the risks and uh, having a proper control mechanism is is the uh, top priority at that point of time i'm talking about six months before opening uh, which is somewhere may uh, 2020 so we uh, took uh, a very simple approach of PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act approach. And then what we did, uh, Global Village, uh, most of you are aware, uh, it's not a single uh, type of uh, business. We have almost everything. We have uh, lots and lots of FNB, as uh, Shanti rightly pointed out. Uh, we have amusement rights. We have entertainment. And then a uh, huge amount of shopping also goes on. So uh, we have to consider basically all these things and then uh, we, uh, we, we started working on a uh, risk mitigation plan. Uh, what we did is uh, we have taken uh, the complete guest journey, starting from parking or even uh, beyond uh, parking. What happens if you're sitting at home, you'll be thinking, let me go to Global Village. At that point of time, maybe they may have some sort of uncertainty or fear factor. So uh, they'll be looking at inform some information which is available in front of them. It can be mobile app or it can be website. So we started from that stage. And then if they are even parking, what are the touch points? And then when, uh, once they come to ticketing counters, once they enter the gate, if they go to a kiosk or a restaurant or enter a pavilion or play in an amusement ride or skilled game. So every single uh, premise has become a touch point for us. So we had identified uh, 60, 70 touch points across Global Village. And then for each touch point, we have identified the risk levels. Uh, some of the touch points are low risk. If you're parking your car and if you're going to enter the gate, maybe you will not touch anything. So it can be a low risk premise or low risk touch point, but some where you have to remove the mask and sit there, a restaurant typically or a prayer room uh, or, or an amusement ride. Here, the risk level goes up because the touch points are there and uh, for some reason they may remove the mask also. So we have looked at all these factors. We, we have uh, devised, we have identified what are the challenges we'll be facing and then we started putting the control measures. Now at this point of time, we started getting uh, the uh, guidelines from, uh, from the authorities, uh, especially from Dubai Tourism, Dubai Municipality and DHA. So we started having some solutions for, for our problems. Uh, so yeah, the plan went on 
and then uh, 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 the most important thing is resources so you may have a very detailed plan but you need money to implement so this is where uh, our management was um, uh, very uh, helpful in allocating all the resources because when it comes to safety uh, global village always stands uh, first uh, even our tagline is uh, we think safety first basically uh, so we have allocated all the resources. We had to build something. It's not just uh, disinfection, uh, uh, sanitization, installing hand sanitizers. For Global Village, we had to basically change some of the structures. For example, uh, for thermal screening, uh, there was no facility here. It was an open area. So your uh, thermal cameras will not work. It, it was not accurate. We did a lot of trials. So we had to build tunnels. So we had built five tunnels uh, by spending lots of money at air-conditioned tunnels. So people used to enter. Uh, when they pass through that, we we managed to identify their body temperatures. So this is one example. We had to build additional prayer rooms, for example. Uh, so all the budgets were allocated. Then implement, uh, implementation started. Uh, during the whole course of time, uh, authorities were really helpful and supportive. Uh, we had uh, different levels of meeting, uh, number of meetings with all the authorities. Uh, we have submitted the plan. We discussed the plan. They were very uh, happy. And then... Uh, uh, even uh, during and after the implementation, uh, they, they inspected, uh, they were also very confident. And finally, we opened the park. When we opened the park, uh, I'll be talking about the challenges, uh, uh, you know, uh, particularly for Global Village, crowd is one one big challenge. So we had to, uh, we have to identify the different uh, crowded areas, heat maps. Uh, I'll be discussing that in the next uh, thing uh, in a detailed way, uh, like the, the different challenges and all. But uh, yeah, during the uh, course of uh, operations, uh, we have devised a monitoring plan. Global Village has its own food safety team and health and safety team. Uh, for pavilions, we had pavilion safety teams. Plus, we have uh, PICs uh, for each of these uh, F&B outlets. So uh, we have helped. We have sit with all our uh, partners. We have helped them to uh, uh, understand the requirements because some of them they may have, they might have come from their countries where the regulations could be different. So we sat with them. We uh, made them understand what are the requirements. We we helped them to uh, understand and devise the checkpoints, and the monitoring started. So. Uh, during the whole season monitoring and uh, uh, basically uh, our uh, complaints levels levels were checked and uh, trainings refresher trainings were ongoing so yeah uh, the the season was very successful thank you thank you so much mr sudarshan um thank you and uh, Rasina, you all have been waiting for a while, but I, I've, you know, I've kept you all till the end because it's very important uh, for us to know what it was like at your end. Uh, Nikki, you are the founder of a group of restaurants, the Zen group of restaurants. Rasina is part of a very huge catering company, uh, Abella & Co. How did the pandemic impact you all, especially in the beginning, and how have you all adapted to it now since, that, since things have opened? Uh, to ensure optimum hygiene uh, for your consumers and your end users. Um, and uh, Nikki, would you like to start? Yeah, glad. Uh, first, Shanti, thank you for having us on this. It's um, quite a pleasure to be sharing a panel with such esteemed guests. Um, having said that, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, everything was very confusing. Uh, there was very little information. Um, there was a lot of... Um, false information that's being passed around. There was no accurate um, implementation of processes or anything for that matter. And that's where the Party um, came along. But we, at the same time, we actually had to also do our own research when it came to finding out um, you know, processes that people were using abroad, places like UK, for example. During the pandemic, one of the things that restaurants all migrated to, number one, was delivery. Now it's about reassuring your customer that you know we're taking the safety protocols for dealing with this in the right way where they are assured or they feel secure enough to be able to order for you, uh, from you. So what we ended up doing is that we, um, I think it was Deliveroo who was one of the first people in the UK to start up with, um, with touchless delivery, which is a process that we implemented. I think one of the first people in the UAE to start that. And um, obviously, you know, Transparency from a restaurant's point to saying things is very different from showing people 
what you're actually doing. So on social media, we did a whole drive where we were educating the customer as to processes that we were working on that was, um, um, you know, uh, that the protocols had been set by Dubai municipality, as well as additional protocols that we were using from, um, that were inspired from other places in the world. So, you know, when it came to kitchen hygiene, when it came to um, delivery packaging, when it came to delivery boys handling the deliveries, when it came to even, um, you know, handing over the delivery to the customer, all of these things were stuff that we were actually portraying to the customer on social media. And we spent a lot of money behind that, um, you know, to sort of educate the customer and let the customer feel secure enough to be able to use our services. And I think this was a blessing for us in disguise because a lot of restaurants reached out to us and we were able to share resources with them. And we were able to come up with common solutions to, um, to, the, uh, to the problem. Obviously, as time has passed, things have become a lot more relaxed as they were. And um, the processes that were implemented from Dubai Municipality, which at that time was very strange to us, has now become part of our everyday life. You know, it's just, um, again, it's about us ensuring that we are following protocols to the T to ensure that, you know, they're being uh, overseen by the managers to ensure that uh, the customers are aware of the steps that we're taking to do that. Because at the end of the day, we have a responsibility, not to just our staff, but also to the general public to let them know that, you know, we can eventually get back to the normal way of life. Having said that, with changes in the way we process things. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, Rasina, would you like to add to that from your perspective? Unmute, uh, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you for this opportunity to be uh, with all these experts and, uh, you know, uh, be listening to all of them, like uh, different perspective, different uh, experiences. So surely this is the right time to discuss uh, the things. Uh, you know, we, as Sabella, we are having mass catering, we are having restaurants, we are having manufacturing as well. So when we are thinking all, uh, you know, the challenges also, Rasina, you're on mute again. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Sorry, Shanti. Is it okay now? I'm so yeah, sorry. Okay. okay. No problem. I was just talking about the, the beginning of the, the, the concern for us because I think it was in January, the first uh, uh, circular was published by Uruguay Municipality. Right then, our customers and clients asked, uh, you know, started to ask them because most of them are from a different industry than food, you know, food. So it's like they don't have a, an expert in hygiene or they don't have much uh, references to look for. So it was all about, as Nikki rightly said, false communications and uh, you know, false information that most of them worried about uh, the virus being passed through food. So it was like how your HACCP is gonna change about this one. So, you know, and even we were not having a right reference to show them, like other than telling that this is not a food related virus, this is something that we have to care the environment, but we were not having a right reference that they can adopt to. But rightly, like the municipality was involving and, you know, they are intervening the right times and we were getting updates and information rightly from CDC and, uh, you know, all those things. So it was really a challenging time for us to, you know, communicate with those people and, you know, bringing their panic to, you know, a low level. Uh, secondly, you know, regarding the cleaning and disinfection inside the kitchen, it's all about, you know, uh, preventing the infection. So uh, in terms of cleaning and disinfection of the food industry, as usual, there is not much things to change because it is not a food related virus at the end and it was confirmed to be so that. So it was, you know, the uh, closure of that type of discussion. But the second part was how the risk assessment has to be done for the touch points and, the, you know, the ways of disinfection, the frequency of dis disinfection. As Bobby said, it's not the same frequency fits all, or it's the same procedure fits for all. You know, if we are having restaurants, so some of them were in the beginning closed, so it was like, okay, we can just leave that part and think of that one later. But we were doing the services in the accommodations and the labor camps where we can't do anything. We have to do cooking, we have to do serving uh, without any, any you know, reduction in numbers and stuff. So it was really challenging in the kitchen in terms of cleaning and disinfection to have the shift separated. You know, in mass catering, we don't have a clear cut shift, you know, changing. It's like 
some people comes and you know that other people are added to that one so if you want to do a real uh, deep cleaning which was a weekly procedure in the regular this thing you now it becomes uh, you know like every 2 hours or every 4 hours you have to do the deep cleaning and you know this is we adopted to misting which will be like more of um, clearing the environment of any possible infection droplets and some because we don't know who are carrying the viruses and at that time the other problem was even if we have a suspected case and uh, you know they go for the testing the results are coming after two days so we don't know in, during this situation whether the person is going to be positive or it is going to be a negative result so everybody are panic and nobody want to get corona so it's like people are um, more reporting symptoms or they are you know panicking and that also creates symptoms so we wanted to increase the confidence of the people also that even if there is one thing that is not going to be you know like uh, going to be the, to the next person so it is to increase the confidence of the people in house as well as the customers so really it was a challenging situation so the other thing was like which type of chemical will be effective and you know were to go for a reliable solution for this one in the beginning there was one or two things that we have done with the approved uh, disinfection companies and it was the, the, the cost factor which was too high and the question was like if we have a system in house and we can do the risk assessment and get a real chemical why we have to adopt a different company for doing this one and how often we can you know spend that much money on that so it was like we developed our own cleaning team in house and it was all about disinfecting even the surfaces and the top of the chillers and freezers you know that they are not waterproof so we had to do something on even on that to cover that one from the you know getting into wet and uh, you know all these things were clearly communicated with all the team so that the people were feeling confident to come and work and they were just having that uh we say the, the belief in the system then uh, you know when it comes to the customers part <clears throat> there are different people as bobby rightly said people behave in different ways some people hello you today again yeah yeah we can hear you okay. can hear you so there are you know some people who really want to listen to us and you know get the information and they are really ready to follow some people are always challenging even if the management of the clients want to you know uh, like listen to us and do something the people behavior was really challenging into that one because they need to get food on time and they don't care what happens after that so yeah you know getting a disinfection time in the labor camps and uh, those things also when they want to really educate that one it really took a lot of time for us now i think we can, we are okay we are settled people know the, the importance of cleaning and disinfection to this uh, pandemic and uh, i think it is smooth uh, bit now Uh, the challenges and other stuff we went through it is a huge list of things that we have to share later inshallah we will we will definitely come to that and finally andrew um tell us about uh, you know the impact that covid-19 has had on your customers uh, reza hygiene is a provider of solutions for the industry so tell us a little about um, you know your challenges as well sure um, thank you shanti uh Sorry, everyone, once again for being late. Uh, slight technical disaster, um, but as Shanti said, um, I'm the country divisional manager for Res Hygiene. So we obviously supply chemicals, supply equipment, supply cleaning, full solution systems, and it's it's been a, a, a very challenging year. I've been in the hygiene industry for. Oh, eighteen years now. Um, started life as a development chemist in UK, and this is the the toughest year I've seen. Um, and I've heard it's very interesting in listening to you all talk because you've all mentioned the things that we've seen. Uh, so I think Nikki said confusing, and that was the biggest thing. Customers, there was too much panic. It was what, why, when, where, what do we do? Um, massive panic everywhere, and then. uh people started doing you know odd things they were being uh, sold odd things i mean the number of people are so using sanitization tunnels the number of people that came to us asking for sanitization tunnels we probably could have set up an entire factory just producing those and, and we had to stop we actually put a statement out saying look you, you can't be spraying chemical on people it's not safe to do so um so what we really tried to do we realized there was a lot of just general panic and misunderstanding in the market so we very quickly put out 
um, infection prevention protocols covering all areas, hotels, schools, hospitals, restaurants, and they gave the customer advice on a lot of things you've talked about today, uh, touch points, where to clean, uh, how to clean, what to use, and the frequency. And um, the key to it was simplicity. Cleaning isn't difficult. If you clean properly, uh, you cover everything to protect yourself against COVID anyway. And that's a, that was all we were trying to emphasize really on everyone is just clean properly and keep it very, very simple. Use the right sanitizer, have it on for the right period of time. And, and that was it. It was just helping our customers through what for them was a, an exceptionally difficult period. Uh, they'd never seen it. Uh, they had businesses closed, businesses open, up, down, up, down. Um, and it was just maintaining that kind of panic and giving them somebody that, uh, some understanding that, look, cleaning is, is important, but just do it right. Keep it simple. Make sure your staff are aware. Um, all principles that um, should be there in place. And, and, and we're, we're quite lucky as a company in the fact that we, uh, we kind of emphasize that on all of our customers anyway, um, because we work with a lot of the international chains that follow quite high standards. Uh, we've got a very multinational team that, um, and, and we try most of our, our, all of our chemicals sort of achieve EN standards, US standards, Saudi SFDA, Dubai. Um, so we, we, we ensure that they're there at the highest standard. We're always giving the right training we feel anyway. So all this was, was just emphasizing the fact to our customers. Um, and and we, we hope we, uh, we, we help through people through the pandemic. Um, but in, for us as well, it was, it was difficult. We had, we had to make changes ourselves in our factory um, because our factory was absolutely flat out. Um, you know, they have never worked so hard. They were an incredible team. Um, and that created its own difficulties. You're trying to, sort of produce products to protect people from COVID, but keep your own staff safe as well. Um, so it was a very difficult and interesting period, but I think um, if there's any good to come out of it for everybody is it, hygiene's kind of more in everyone's mindset now. Um, you know, we should see some changes which needed to happen, I feel, in, a, in, in the industry and in a lot of areas. We should hopefully see uh, kind of higher standard of products um, across the industry. You know, you know, there's a lot of people selling things that shouldn't really be used. And also we, sh we should see a higher standard um, across uh, all sites. Um, you know, people have realized that hygiene is important. It's not something that you should really just gloss over because of the impact it has on, on the entire business. So interesting times. Hopefully we're all through it or getting to the back of it now, because um, I, I think everyone needs a break. I know my staff do, I know I do. So uh, fingers crossed for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Well said, Andrew. I'm going to um, address this question that we've got from uh, Mr. Mohammed Altaf. Uh, this one, uh, he's asked two questions, but I'm going to address the one to Dr. Martin and Mr. Allen. Um, what he's asked is, is there any specific management system uh, that has come up that can deal with COVID-19 in food, health, veterinary, and consumer-related premises? Um, do you want me to repeat the question once again? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, is there any specific management system that has come up to deal with COVID-19 in food, health, veterinary, veterinary and consumer-related premises? That's the question. So any thoughts on that? Both Mr. Allen and Dr. Martin. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I don't see any new management system per se. Um, and I think Alan just mentioned it, uh, that it's just doing things uh, correctly and simply. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'd like to pick up on something that was mentioned earlier, uh, particularly with small premises who maybe don't have the resources or maybe the, the training. Um, and, and I think it also comes back to understanding. Um, it's one of the things that we've noticed over the years, particularly in, in food service, where 
and also in hospitals where there's a high turnover and a, a demand for a quick cleaning service um, is that people rush it and they don't spend the time to do it correctly uh, as alan said you know keep it simple it's down to time contact time the right chemical for the right place um, and when you measure something and you can demonstrate uh, the effectiveness um, then a kind of light goes on with the person who's delivering the training they understand the importance of doing things correctly uh, and we've seen that with the technology that we use uh, to demonstrate um, and I'll mention it in the talk later on uh, some experiences from London 2012 Olympics where the food service uh, delivery and the inspection service went in to do not so much an inspection a an, an audit and a training so it demonstrated the right way to clean and then the person delivering the cleaning suddenly realizes oh so if i do things in this way i get a much better result so they take the time and the effort to do things correctly alan yes thanks dr martin thanks shanti uh, um just the answer to the question raised by the uh, one of the audience, obviously, yes, we have a, there's a lot, lots of organizations that develop different actually systems. And as I said, right at the beginning of my talk, we, uh, you know, been uh, dealing with HACCP for 30, 40, 50 years, HACCP, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points in food, which is very specific to the food industry. And probably actually specific to other industries developed in different things and it's been customized to a different actually sectors i mean i i used to work for the food industry uh, i used to work in gerber foods uh, in england um, and i um, you know we used to actually um, implement hasab on food production lines and it was easy to do because you know if you got we used to actually produce a lot of um, juices so you've got a production line for orange juice or production line for apple juice you've got one raw material and one end product. Uh, and then I moved to the catering industry 25 years ago, but catering because I was actually sort of assigned to implement HACCP on an Isle cruise boat or a small hotel. It, it was an interesting thing because I came up from a very large food organization, a food factory, then went to a small kitchen on an Isle cruise boat. And then I said, I went to a chef in, in, in Egypt, in Luxor, and I said, oh, do you have HACCP? The guy thought I was stupid. What is bloody HACCP? Sorry, it's using a bad word. He said, oh, a HACCP is this and this and that. He said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, where's your wash hand basin? He said, oh, what is a wash hand basin? I mean, these are the basic things. Now, we are um, sort of, I mean, that is obviously developed and evolved uh, into different sectors. And I, I touch on the comments made by Dr. Martin and Erwa and Bobby uh, with regards to, I start with Dr. Martin, which actually the key point he mentioned is rapid testing. Part of the system, and I'm gonna go into the system in a minute, part of the system and part of actually sort of responding and recovering to COVID-19 is testing, is testing, testing, testing. In Europe and America, they do a lot of COVID-19 testing. I'm not talking about the COVID-19 testing for humans only, but a lot of surface uh, testing. Um, we, I mean, I, from my point of view, as a, our point of view as a service provider, consultancy and training, we do a lot of testing on the service. We use, uh, obviously, uh, the ATP test kit, just actually sort of an indication of contamination in the service. That means hygiene level. That means cleanness. That means actually sort of exposure to spread of an infection, uh, not necessarily micro, you know, microbiological or chemical, but also a viral. So um, testing is important. The second element is very important. Uh, I, I suppose Andrew actually mentioned is training, training and training and training. Uh, yes. Training is, is a, also is a continuous process. You cannot actually just do one training and forget about it. If you go to a restaurant or hotels or even you know, public places, at the beginning, there are people actually, you know, the staff are wearing masks, uh, uh, disinfection, um, 
all kind of PPE, social distancing. Now it's becoming more loose, so they forgot. So we need to remind them. It has to be a refresher because it's, you know, uh, vaccinations in place. It's, there's a massive vaccination campaigns in everywhere uh, around the world. So actually, some Middle Eastern countries haven't obviously advanced to that level that it could cover the whole population. But vaccination is actually is important. But we still have to ask this sort of, you know, keep in place all the preventive measures, all the pro proactive actually actions that you take in. It's not just reacting. It's being it's not reactive actually things. It's a proactive, and that's why I mentioned a a comprehensive risk management system. Comprehensive risk management system include the cleaning, the disinfection, the testing, the training, the protocols that you implement within your environment, within the industry. Um, yes, uh, Erwa said, large organization have the resources, have the ability to actually sort of implement a full risk management system. We call it POSI now. POSI is related to HACCP somehow. POSI is prevention of spread of infection. And it is also providing a certificate if people are interested in certificates. But more importantly, the POSI, which we invented, I claim, is uh, the prevention of spread of infection. Uh, it's very similar to HASA in terms of actually sort of methodic um, um, implementation of uh, protocols, enforce it on the ground. Uh, and it's not only about cleaning and disinfection or redesigning, it's, it covers everything. It covers water installations, it covers facilities, it covers equipment, uh, people, operational practices, um, uh, um, delivery, transportations, um, taxis, security, gates, um, um, uh, parking lots, um, Everything that you do in your, whether if you have a hotel, then, I mean, we talk about HACCP, right? it, it needs to be applied from farm to fork. Well, POSI is the same way because the virus is obviously very spreadable and it needs to be controlled at every step of your, of operation in your business. Now, customizing POSI, and Erwa said, can you have a bakery of two people that you can apply even HACCP or I personally, I'm an old HACCP person as a food uh, technologist. Uh, we applied HACCP on um, food vehicles, selling sausages and burgers with one person serving, or even actually full on tamiya, which is a traditional Egyptian food cards. Can you believe that? Yes, we did. On a small Nile cruise boat. Yes, we did. We can apply that. We now actually develop posi check. And I'm not promoting this. Um, for warehouses, uh, uh, staff accommodations, uh, camps, restaurants, fast food, hotels, um, office facilities, um, and then now airports with different actually sort of facilities in it. Uh, and also, actually, it could be applied in, in, in any public place, but hotels, restaurants, uh, and small actually sort of outlets. Also, you can actually sort of apply any kind of system, and I believe in system implementation rather than just doing the, or following the guidelines. The guidelines are easy. It's hand, hy hand hygiene, it's social distancing, it's PPE, it's um, disinfectant. And that's what we do. I mean, I carry my disinfectant all the time. Uh, if I'm not alone, I put my mask. That's, you know, it's it become part of your life. Uh, but also there's an, uh, you know, it has to be an in-depth, uh, uh, seriously, an in-depth look at <clears throat> your way of doing the business, which has changed, obviously, your commitment, <clears throat> sorry, the infection control roles and responsibilities, training, and resource allocation, allocation, in addition to assessment of physical environment. So it, it's massive um, uh, and it is, um, and I would like to take the opportunity to say that POSI, it just goes beyond following during guidelines and getting a manual um, and then say, oh, this is, these are the guidelines. And there are lots of things there, the clean, safe, I don't know, hygiene, what, and all that. But it is basically what 
The way we do it and the way we believe we have to do it, it's not only this, it's on the job training, it's hand holding, and we do a lot of audits. If you actually implement a posi check, uh, we do checks almost 12 times a year. Uh, I know it's a bit intense, uh, but it, it is, it's something that is continuous. The virus is spreading very easily. Uh, and um, if you just lose sight of, uh, of simple procedures that you are um, following, then you could actually easily spread again. And I'm not sort of, I'm not, you know, scaremongering, but this is important, it's vital. People are actually sort of probably losing sight of the very basic rules and simple rules, but also they need to be checked, trained, uh, and things need to be verified all the time, testing and auditing uh, and other aspects actually of a, as I said, comprehensive risk management system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, uh, Bobby, you've been putting up a couple of links on uh, the chat as well, uh, you know, regarding the <clears throat> uh, system. What I wanted to uh, know is a little more about it, uh, about these links that you've been putting up. We've, obviously, our audience has been, uh, it has been shared with our audience. And I also want to start, um, you know, we have a, uh, about half an hour left. And I really want to talk about the importance of training right now in all these aspects. Um, I think the biggest takeaway that we've had from our um, discussion up till now has been the importance of educating uh, people and training them in the right way to customize their hygiene and cleaning practices to their premises. So if you can touch upon number one, the links that you've sent regarding the management system and number two upon training, what you guys are doing, and then I'll take that forward across everybody as well. Shati, the links that I've posted are specifically for the management system approaches. So ISO has published a, a very specific standard for health and safety requirements in the wake of pandemic. So that's a very good standard if you want to look at uh, a, a broad standard that you want to implement and audit and certify. Uh, the second one is one of those uh, standards which are more uh, like uh, more specific to certification bodies. Uh, that's from AIB. There are a lot of standards which are, are developed by private auditing firms uh, that you can see. And then as Alan was mentioning, uh, there are also agencies uh, that, that customize the checks for, for businesses. So I think uh, it, it, it's up to the business to choose whatever they want to and utilize it. Uh, an important aspect that I want to, to bring into the table is uh, that, uh, and I'm sure that everybody in the room kind of agrees to this point that it's just not a single approach of, of understanding cleaning. It's a, it's a very comprehensive uh, you know, uh, approach of, of managing infections that, uh, that, we, that we have to do in the wake of COVID. Uh, and um, CDC has published data, which is more relevant to US, which says that one in 10,000 touches lead to an infection. Whereas your, your contact with the person who is ill or in the press, uh, you know, your, your, your presence in, in, a, in, a, in a room with a lot of people uh, who could be carriers, uh, is, uh, the transmission rates are in, uh, you know, substantially higher. So um, uh, points from Sudarshan here, looking at Global Village, looking at touch points, where are those people removing the mask? Where, 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 do, those, uh, where, where do people interact more? Uh, you know, uh, and where is, where is the infection? Uh, load likely to be higher are all things that you need to understand. And cleaning has to complement that because, uh, you know, even though the, the numbers one in 10,000 would look like a very low possibility, we don't realize how many times we touch surfaces. So that, that kind of uh, has to be in our back. Even at that lower rate uh, or, or seemingly lower rates, you've got to be really conscious about uh, how surfaces are maintained and, 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 and controlled. The aspect of training uh, has been particularly important, Shanti, but uh, uh, the, the good thing about COVID is that people are seeing the need immediately, so they respond very well to trainings. If you're talking about a food safety incident and you say that you're likely to get a salmonella infection, uh, one in uh, 10,000 people are likely to be sick, nobody cares about it. You, know? you don't see an impact uh, because you don't, you don't get a protection for salmonella. You're talking about a very low likelihood. With COVID, people always had a benefit. So I can protect myself, I can protect my family, I can protect my colleagues. And it was very rewarding for them from that perspective that if I take care of myself, uh, I can also protect others. So that way, the response to training has been, uh, uh, has been good. But then the, the challenge was to, to get the right kind of materials for training. You know? uh, so as Rosina pointed out earlier, there are a lot of uh, uh, tools being sold in the market uh, as Andrew pointed out, you know, tunnels coming in as a single step solution. 
that also is a part of training, right? How do you tell people uh, that this is not the right thing to do and something else is more important and, and, uh, and, and you must focus on that? I think uh, that risk-based understanding still is missing in, in, in many, uh, many organizations. It's not that they don't want to do things. It's just that they don't have the right information. Uh, and I think, uh, yes, we still do not know much about the virus uh, and, and we still cannot say what works well and what doesn't. But I think reasonably uh, good understanding can really improve uh, the way we are looking at. If we identify our hotspots uh, and touch points very well, I think we can still understand uh, the uh, and, and manage the disease better. And uh, I think uh, trainings have to be dynamic. I mean, we have to change the information based on that uh, available information. And it has to be also understood that information will change. So a lot of people tell us, this is not the same thing that you told us two months ago. I mean, that's exactly how things are. It is, it is changing uh, as we uh, change our understanding, our requirements may change. So be willing to change what you've learned, unlearn and, and relearn. I mean, that's that's the approach that we will have for this pandemic moving forward. Thank you so much, Bobby. Uh, Mr. Edwa, would you like to add to that in terms of uh, the training aspect? Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just going to interrupt here. I am I seem to be having a sort of network issue. So in case I go off again, please do continue talking about uh, the training thing across the board. Thank sure. you so much. Sure. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Actually, really, it is interesting to hear you, all of you, and uh, this uh, point of view from all of you. Uh, with regard of training, yes, as Bobby said, uh, and everybody agree, it is one of the most important elements to be uh, fulfilled and as a part of uh, regulatory authority enforcement of training one of our essential part and one of the things that we are always um, uh, putting in our uh, priorities uh, when it comes to uh, COVID time and training and actually still we are facing these difficulties of we cannot gather everybody in, in training now it is everything online and these are the most challenges now we are facing uh, online and sometime uh, network not available. Sometimes uh, staff, they will go here and there and they will not be focus, uh, f focusing uh, uh, totally with, with training. Uh, so we always rely on how we can uh, strengthen that uh, person in charge, somebody food safety in charge, somebody should be there to look after maybe ongoing training, on job training, which is most effective than just uh, giving sometimes sessions online and and is sitting for six or four or five hours um, looking to a screen. So in, in this regard, we, we, are, we are working on how uh, somebody should be there in, in, in even if it is small or medium or big size to look after on job training to, uh, to do, uh, uh, Mr. Andrew, maybe he said uh, practical training and simple uh, training for, for cleaning because it's matter of applying a chemical, matter of uh, waiting maybe a contact time you need to be aware of that. Maybe uh, to be able to read a label uh, and an instruction of, of, of a bottle of, of, of chemical, these things, it is, it is very important. Uh, dilution, how people uh, uh, need to know about dilution, which is very important also. Uh, approved chemical, not approved chemical, one of the challenges. And, and, and um, uh, Mr. Andrew, he said about tunnel, sanitizing tunnel. It was a challenge. And yes, it was not clear. What things use? Sometimes people will come with UV light. Can we use UV light? Can we use this tunnel? It was like an, an, an it was an, like an, an era using a tunnel. And we come to with some complaint, as he said, I got an allergy uh, while I'm entering this hypermarket because I apply this chemical and I was not aware. And, and so many uh, complicated when you complicate cleaning. So keep it simple and uh, try to make it on job training to try, try to make it always work uh, to, to have a food safety in charge in your premises, somebody who knows things and able to reach to everybody in, in, in his counter where he was where, where he's working, uh, a chef doing uh, cooking, somebody should be near to him to just tell him how to clean, how to sanitize on the spot. Uh, this is what we, we learn from this. Thank you, Mr. Erwa. Um, would you like to add to this, Mr. Sudarshan, with regard to how you all have trained the FNB operators in um, at Global Village? What were your challenges involved in training them? Uh, yeah, when it comes to Global Village, uh, our challenge is people are coming from different countries. 
and uh, uh, we are a seasonal park so you train them uh, you keep them for six months and then you lose them so again new set of people may come for next season uh, so our training should be uh, highly effective so that they remember what they uh, what we are uh, basically telling them and uh, they should implement on ground also so what we did as a first step as i told you a uh, risk mitigation plan was developed uh, we have a manual called uh, hse manual which we give to all our partners uh, because we know people are coming from uh, different places they may not be aware not only about covid uh, maybe about the regulation in this country so uh, for all the business you know business specific hse manual is done if you are going to operate an amusement ride or if you are going to just operate a small trolley inside global village uh what are the requirements you just go to that section that particular page will give you very briefly how to set up you don't even require a trade license if you are going to operate a kiosk or trolley you just have to uh, apply for uh, dubai municipalities uh, online permit it's a temporary permit which they will give you for a period of time uh, with that again uh, we will be sitting with you and again uh, with uh, this pandemic in place we have given the risk mitigation plan which is applicable for their specific business so we have taken out kiosk or trolley whatever is applicable for them we sat with them we told them these are the uh, controls you have to apply these are the ap approved disinfections uh, which is coming uh, from the dubai municipality uh, this should be the frequency of the touch point and uh, people management uh, again another vast subject we can talk forever basically putting them in bubbles uh, how to uh, report symptoms uh, transparency people can hide issues so how uh, how is the transparency between the partner and uh, global village and authority uh, so at the beginning when we were about to open uh, we had uh, orientation sessions with all these plans in place and then as soon as we opened again you may had a training with the owner of the uh, premise Uh, but on ground you may have two three people uh, who are the staffs ideally so maybe there is a communication gap so again what we did we went we met the staffs uh, the staff could be pic or uh, he, he could be a food handler uh, or a waiter so we had uh, we had to run number of sessions uh, to to basically brief them uh, tell them what are the requirements and then again and again as bobby rightly pointed out the information keeps changing earlier it was 14 days quarantine then it has become 10 days quarantine uh, uh, so we have to basically keep them updated as well so number of refresher trainings in their own language is another important thing uh, we had number of people coming from turkey number of people coming from thailand who are not very good in in, in arabic or english so there is no point in uh, doing a session in english or arabic so we had used uh, translators in that case so we had used people who speak thai uh, so that the training is very effective and then we started running the effectiveness uh, you know we started measuring the effectiveness of the training we started throwing questions to them to understand how good is our training so where we have to improve and uh, uh, we started giving the training materials to them and uh, we we requested them to paste it in their kitchen so uh, if if there is any uh, doubt they can uh, they can go through that or they can come to us we established a number specifically for reporting these kind of challenges or uh, asking for help so it was challenging but again uh, for global village it is more uh, looking at the diversity of people involved uh, you know uh, the language and uh, cultural uh, challenges but we have uh, somehow handled it and now we have more information in hand compared to season 25 so we are preparing uh, for the next season thank you thank you mr sudarshan um let's let's move on to uh, you know the end consumer bit uh, nikki tell me about um, training at your restaurant how are you training how have you been training your chefs how have you been training your staff uh and also a little about the food delivery aspect because uh, now uh, you know especially during lockdown and maybe even now uh, there is a higher dependency on food delivery uh so tell us a little about the hygiene aspect in that as well as training um so one of the things that we always focus on is intensive training when it comes to the staff and the protocols that have been set up um we are tied up with diversity who supplies the chemicals to us and every 15 days we do a training session with them as well and we enforce this in staff obviously in dubai you know habits change people are coming from different backgrounds you have people you know who are not always educated you have um, 
there are a lot of struggles when it comes to people understanding what they're supposed to do. So, you know, we, the PIC, the manager, we have on floor, and I'll give you one restaurant, for example, in JLT, we have three PICs uh, present over here at any point of time because it is, it is multiple kitchens, it's multiple restaurants within one space. The management of that, again, is it's a very intensive um, operation that we have. Yeah, it's very labor intensive. It's very, um, it, it's, it's, it's like a white elephant, you know? And, um, you know, keeping that same thing. And over here, we have no closed kitchens. Everything is open. Everything is, um, people can see into the kitchens. They can see the staff, what they're doing. You know, there have been times when, you know, the staff obviously is, being on the walk, you know, it's hot, sweaty, they'll put their mask down. You know, these are these are times when the person, uh, the PIC in the kitchen will tell them, please step outside for a minute, go, you know, wash yourself, refresh yourself, and then come back, put your mask on. You know, the customers can take a look. Again, for us, be it delivery, be it anything else, you know, we do at an average of about 200 deliveries a day. When you're doing that as well, it's very difficult because people are meeting you know, our delivery boys over here, um, they're meeting people every day. We don't know who's, um, you know, who's positive, but who's not. Obviously, yes, we are in a much better position than we are now. But having said that, we have, it, the process is very, it's, it's very scattered. So we have, our, uh, it comes down to firstly, ensuring that you know that you're putting your staff in secure surroundings. So this is where it comes down to accommodation. Our delivery boys live in one accommodation provided by us. Our kitchen staff, we have split them up into three accommodations. And, you know, so in the given chance, luckily, you know, touch wood with God's grace, we have, none of our staff have tested positive throughout this whole process. Um, you know, call it luck, call it the fact that we've been, we've been very consistent when it comes to our protocols and our trainings and our processes that we're putting forward over here which is avoiding them to have direct contact with the, uh, with the, uh, with the end user at the same time. Uh, when it came to um, deliveries, for example, so till today, we still enforce the delivery boys to ensure that when they're carrying the food, the food firstly is packed um, by the delivery handler. The delivery handler will, um, you know, we're, we're very eco-friendly when it comes to our packaging, but throughout COVID, we've had to make amends to our packaging protocol so we've um you know we we, we double pack and we repack our dishes and uh and cling film as well then when it sits back to be here the delivery boys carry it the the, uh, the bags it's ensured they sanitize after every delivery um the deliveries when it's gone to the customer they, they have a particular protocol on how they visit how they approach the customer's doorstep so they'll approach the customer's doorstep They'll put the bag down, they'll open the, uh, the box, and then they'll take a step back. They have to maintain the two meters distance. In the restaurant, it's not as easy as that. Obviously, with the mass dressing in loud, in loud uh, areas, communication is very difficult. You know, uh, with the mass there, people can't obviously communicate as easy as they could, as they could earlier. But at the same time, you know, we still insist on people, you know, maintaining that distance uh, from the from the customer, you know, every time, this is where I've had to actually be here as well quite often. And my managers are always on the floor inspecting and making sure that things are done in a proper manner. So, you know, you'll have a customer that will get up from the table and they won't wear the mask when they walk into the counter or they walk, in, walk into the toilet. And this is where our staff are trained to tell them immediately, please don't, don't step up, please wear a mask and come back over here. People in general have become very lax. And this is, it's, it could be a good thing, but it's also a very bad thing. Um, it's a bad thing because, you know, a lot of people are still, they're, they're, there's there's no one fixed formula and say that this is how COVID is transmitted or, uh, you know, uh, somebody could be asymptomatic. They could be a, a, somebody who can spread something, but at the same time. So keeping all of these things in mind, this is where vigorous trainings come into place, you know, and weekly trainings are done with the, with the floor staff, Five weekly trainings are done with the kitchen staff. We've created our SOPs in line with the cleaning schedule where every hour our surfaces are cleaned down, um, the right chemicals are being used. We've had to hire an additional two people, I believe, 
um, yes, that's right. We've had to hire two people who are just overseeing all of this. So safety does come before anything else. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, Rasina, can you add to that in terms of uh, training at Abel? Hello? Yes, we can yes Shanti. Let me just talk about what how it is happening in Avela because uh, in mass catering, uh, as always we say, uh, the concept of formal training that is now, I think it is completely changed now. The part is that, you know, giving the awareness to the people and changing the behavior of the people in line with that one. So what we do in Avela is, uh, you know, it is very difficult to gather the people or, you know, to reach out to the people. So uh, information are made as uh, food safety, uh, sorry, posters for the COVID safety. And as Bobby rightly said, it is like changing information. I think almost 12 times or 13 times we had to change the posters and send new information about the controls and all that. People are complaining like every time I wait is different, but this is a requirement and it is happening. Second thing is like, you know, about the updates on the, uh, the social distancing or uh, what we say, like quarantine, these things. We are just making it into small bullet points. These will be sent to the to the, to the the key PICs of the location because in a mass catering kitchen, there will be one main PIC and there will be subsessions. We do have a daily scoring system for food safety. It's like every section, there is one in charge who is responsible to maintain food safety part of that one. And there will be an inspection daily happening by PAC. When there is a mistake in PAC uh, inspection, they'll be getting a red point. And if there is, uh, you know, everything great, they will be having a gain point. And at, at the end of a quarter, we are calculating these counts and uh, we'll be recognizing the best team. So it is a matter of, uh, you know, incorporating the COVID control programs into that one. So best to, the, the first part is to create awareness, to reach the information to the right people. So PAC is checking. You know, every day when we or every time when we are sending the information, this is going to the, the notice board where the team leaders are uh, are you know supposed to or they are obliged to go and read the information and cascade the information to their respective team. When the PAC go for his inspection, the checking is whether all the team are informed of that one. So every day before the session, they are just giving like two, three minutes briefing about the updated information on that one. So it is mandatory for the team leader to cascade the information for him. So this is a score for them. So it's uh, it's like everybody are informed and even if once some, someone is lagging, they do have a discussion, uh, you know, maybe in the rest, in the, what we say, staff canteen or somewhere like, uh, today there is a new information. If the other session didn't get that one, those people are responsible for that one. So it is more of making them responsible to, you know, for the safety of their team and as well as, you know, making it uh, at their own end. And uh, the thing is like, we used to get questions and clarifications. So when we are having much uh, of those type of clarifications required, we do keep a Zoom session from my point, uh, my part or the other food safety specialist so that they can clarify all the information and you know get those information updated if required to that level. So, uh, you know, the question was always like uh, documenting these trainings as well as about uh, you know doing the review of the the effectiveness of that one. We are most of the, well, some of the locations we are not able to go because they are isolated by themselves by the client and we don't know how much it is happening over there. But still, there are you know risk of infection happening. So it's all like you know they used to send us some communication details or the, the signed papers and other things so that we can verify it is reaching. Uh, I'm not saying that 100% is uh, you know, uh, manageable from all the locations, but at the same time, wherever we identify more risk or more uh, reachability is required, this is this was verified from our point of uh, our from our end as well. And uh, yeah, about the the chemicals and other things, we do we had to change the chemicals a bit of times, and during that time also. Rather than depending on the chemical supplies communication, we used to we did take the, the initiative to train the people from our part and why the, the concentration of contact because you know contact time less contact time is a major uh, thing that we were looking forward to at this time because we have limited time and we have to do this and so the chemical that we were using was having a comparatively higher contact time so we had to adopt something that was really you know acting in short time. I think uh, we were successful in reaching those things, but at the same time, the formal trainings, the formal food safety training, the uh, other things, I think we had to compromise a, a lot on that one because the focus was mainly on uh, COVID at this time. That is a fact that I have done. Thank you so much, Rosina. Um, Andrew, uh, finally coming to you. 
tell us a little about uh, how you guys as a service, as a solution provider have been training your customers in using the right kind of chemicals and the right procedures. Sure. Um, so, so training has always been the forefront for us. Um, it's, it's something that's just ridiculously important. I've been very lucky to work for uh, two companies in, across my time in the hygiene industry, and both of them put more emphasis on training than probably anything else. Uh, selling chemicals, providing chemicals, providing equipment, lots of people can do that. Can you train to the right level? Probably not. And training is absolutely critical. Um, it, it, if you're providing a something that is utilized to um, prevent COVID, you need to provide the, the right training. If you are providing something that is utilized for food safety, um, you've got to back it up with training, regular focus training. And, and it's we've always had that in place. Um, so we have hygiene audit teams that visit customer sites and provide regular auditing, regular training. Um, we do refresher trainings um, and trainings. It's absolutely um, key to any organization. All, all, all we've perhaps done is maybe um, stepped it up a little bit. Um, we've had to come up with new ways of giving the training sessions. Um, obviously, we couldn't do certain training in the way that we'd like. We're very much a hands-on company. We prefer to be in front of the customer, um, you know, demonstrating, showing them how to clean uh, across all levels. Uh, you'll never see me in a suit um, because I've ruined so many of them getting down on my knees, showing people how to clean. It's, it's key, but we couldn't do a lot of that in COVID. So we had to shift to online and, and that's a bit more difficult. I think um, what we said a great thing earlier and that was dynamic. The training's all about being dynamic. It's, if it's not interesting, it doesn't go in and it's, it's, you've got to identify, and I feel our team, um, my team are very good at that. You've got to identify what level you're training at and train to that level, but make it interesting for that level. So you might give a very different training session to a group of directors and managers as to uh, a session with cleaners, um, but it should be fun um, with the right points involved. And that's what we try to do. Um, if you if you try to be serious all the time, particularly in COVID, it's a it's it's a big topic. People are worried about it, but it does train them by scaring them. It doesn't work that way. Um, train them to make sure they understand why they're doing this, and uh, you know they should be proud of what they're doing, particularly in cleaning. Cleaning is often seen as a uh, let's see, uh, you know, it's a, it's a low paid job and in a lot of cultures, it's seen as the lowest of the low. Uh, I've been a cleaner. Uh, I was a cleaner through uni to, you know, pay for my studies. And it's not a lowly job. It's an important job. And you as a trainer can make that person feel important um, by training in the right way, by being dynamic. Uh, my staff often, uh, when they watch me train, they say, well, that was... I've never seen you do that before. Um, and it's because you've got to change it each time, make it up, you know, do something different. Um, but make, the key is make sure the core critical points are the same every time. Um, so as I say, training has uh, been key for us. We've, we've stepped it up. Um, we've got more people asking us for what we call kind of monthly repeat audit type training, um, which is, is good because well, we always offer it, but customers I think often see it as a negative sometimes they look at it and think well I don't want to be audited um, because they'll find out I'm doing wrong but they're now realizing actually if you ask us in or ask a company in to do regular updates and training they're going to keep you at a correct level so training is absolutely key can't emphasize it enough thank you so much Andrew so we have the last five minutes uh, left um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to take too many questions, but there's this very interesting uh, question we've had from the audience, um, which is more thoughtful. Uh, so Anwar Luati, I hope I have pronounced your name properly, says, uh, rather asks, do you not think that the approach we've been using for more than a year regarding COVID-19 should be reviewed because we have the necessary hindsight to improve upon it? 
So um, I'm just going to repeat that question again. Do you not think that the approach we've been using for more than a year regarding COVID-19 should be reviewed because we have the necessary hindsight to improve it? So if each of you can give me one statement as an answer to this, and then we shall conclude. Okay, sorry, Shant. Can I just um, yes. dip in there? Um, obviously, with the pandemic still continuing, it's probably in the long run. Uh, things, uh, obviously, the information are more solid now for the industry. Um, they can actually deal with the prevention of spread of infection, but things are changing all the time. As much as the virus itself is mutating, things are changing. We, as we call ourselves, maybe hygiene specialists, learn as we go along uh, every day. The new things, uh, Bobby mentioned this, the new regulations, new guidelines, new things are, um, uh, and specifically to the industry, and, I, and I'm talking about the industry itself, uh, whatever industry is, food, uh, health, otherwise, uh, probably actually won't be able to control the end consumer. We're still some of that, some of the uh, public is confused. Uh, but as far as the industry is concerned, um, and like of Rosina and Nikki, they're doing a good job uh, in, in terms of their um, work and environment whether it's training and uh, otherwise. Yes, there, there has to be, I mean, it's part of the a system um, management review or system review. Um, you know, uh, I keep mentioning risk assessment. Uh, so, you know, auditing, as Andrew mentioned, it is very important. Some people get bored of it, but it's just important. But more importantly is... Uh, training and training is not about just accredited training is more of an in-house customized close to the heart training uh, and that is available uh, the other th thing which is available is um, the virtual um, auditing or training which is available which actually facilitates it's not as good as the you know, on-site but it, it is also available for people actually to do there's obviously new technology. We use something called in-view auditing, which is a camera going through the kitchen or the facility, and then you can um, do a, an assessment, a check uh, on a facility uh, through that. So, yes, uh, there has to be always, um, even WHO and CDC actually sort of issuing new uh, guidelines in terms of what you need to do to respond and recover. So things are changing uh, all the time, and we learn every day, even if we call ourselves as experts or specialists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, anybody, any parting uh, comments? I'll just, uh, very quickly, um, I, th I think the way that question is geared at is that if people are looking to go back to their easier times. And the one thing I'd just like to say is don't, in terms of cleaning. Um, we've got to learn from this. Yes, we can become a little bit more relaxed on terms of, you know, I, I live in Bahrain. Um, I, we've seen things uh, a little bit more relaxed here. Um, I was out to a restaurant the other day, but it's um, things like keeping four to a table. I think we need to keep in place uh, the basics and cleaning. Just don't, uh, the worst thing that could ever happen is if everybody just, when, when everything opens and it goes back to normal, people go back to normal. Just keep the same standards. Your restaurants, your organizations, your hotels, whatever, will be better for it. Cleaning is just critical to everything. You know? Customers can go where they want. If they walk into your restaurant and it's dirty, they'll just walk out and go to another one. You know, there's, there's no brand loyalty anymore unless you create that brand loyalty. So hopefully we won't change in terms of hygiene standards. But yes, it'd be nice to see the relaxation and we can actually be a bit more free. I'd like to leave you with a quote, um, which comes from uh, 
a quality guru, uh, H.J. Harrington, and he says, uh, measurement is the first step that leads to control and eventually to improvement. Mm -hmm. If you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. And if you can't control it, you can't improve it. And technology helps you to do that in demonstrating the importance of cleanliness, where it can be improved, and also to communicate that to staff, which then leads to behavior change. And uh, that secures everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to end this discussion here. I'm sorry I couldn't take more questions, but I think it was a very, very insightful discussion. So I would like to thank all of you very, very sincerely for coming on board uh, this panel discussion and this event to actually start off uh, the two-day event. Uh, thanks a lot. All the best and have a good day. Thank you so thank much, you. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you.